Well, hello again. It's uh, Rufus Singleton here. Glad to be back with you. Uh, today we're going to pick up in uh, the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we do thank you for the gift of life in your son, Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that is in his name. Lord, we pray that you would be in our midst as we open up scripture, that our eyes would be enlightened, that you would strengthen us, Lord, build us up in our faith, that we might walk upright before you, Lord. So please bless us as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen, amen. Well, I'm looking forward to this. Um, we're jumping into chapter six, but before we do, let's recall for just a moment how chapter five end, we ended. We know that the, uh, the disciples, the apostles, um, led by Peter, uh, were subjected to corporal punishment rather severely. They were flogged. Uh, that couldn't have been fun. But they were released by the Sanhedrin. And at the very end of chapter five, we see that they continue to minister the word of God. Let's look at that final verse of chapter five together. <clears throat> Uh, 542 reads, every day in the temple complex and in various homes, they continue teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Praise the Lord. So that brings us to the end of chapter 5, and now we move into chapter 6. I'm going to begin our time together by reading the first uh, seven verses of chapter 6, the first portion, and we'll take a look at that, and then we'll move on. So let's read those verses together. Verse 1, in those days, as the number of the disciples was multiplied, uh, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their wills were being overlooked in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, it would, it would not be right for us to give up or to neglect preaching about God to handle financial matters or the serving of tables. So therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. The proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the preaching about God flourished. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Our first seven verses. So let's, let's first take a look at two things that seem to stand out. We see the expansion of the Lord's church. And the first thing that's pointed out to us is this growth. It wasn't slow growth. It was it was more multiplicative. It, it, it was a, it was an increase that was great. That's the first thing we see about the expansion of the growth in the Lord's church uh, at this particular time. And secondly, I want you to notice is uh, the term disciple. If I come back up here to the very first verse, in those days, as the number of disciples was multiplying. Right. Well, that term disciple, right, in the basic sense, in the basic sense, it means a pupil or a learner. Right. But here it's clearly used synonymously with with a, con a convert to Christ, a, a redeemed believer, a New Testament saint, if you will, or a person who is uh, in Christ. And um, and the reason that's so is that because following Jesus as a disciple, right, means the unconditional sacrifice of one's whole life for the whole of his life. So to be a disciple means to be bound to Jesus and to do God's will. Right? So as the narrative unfolds, um, we see that some degree of trouble visits this church community in the form of a, uh, a complaint. And this particular complaint happens to be leveled by the Hellenistic Jews. Well, who were they? Well, these were Jewish, Greek-speaking members of this church in Jerusalem. Uh, these particular individuals had returned to Jerusalem from outside of Palestine after years or perhaps even generations of being away. And recall at the um, end of chapter 
before, we met an individual, our friend uh, Barnabas, his uh, given name being Joseph. He too, or I shouldn't say he too, but he was, he was from Cyprus, and therefore he was a Hellenistic Jew. Okay? And so we, we know of this Barnabas, and uh, we're going to see him again later in the book of Acts. Now, this complaint was leveled against the Jewish Hebraic members of the church in Jerusalem. So who were they? Well, these were native-born Palestinian Jews who spoke Aramaic as their native tongue. So what was their complaint? Well, their complaint was that their widows, the Hellenistic right, members of the church, the Hellenistic Jews, they were being overlooked in what is called the, the daily distribution. Notice a couple things, that the complaint, first of all, it, did not, it didn't stem from the widows, but because of them. Okay. And then recall widows in this society, um, they were particularly vulnerable, right? So what we see is this fledgling church was clearly systematically seen to their primary needs, uh, making provision for them. Um, and what we know about these widows, in fact, is that later the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy much later, would give an imperative to the church to honor and to support widows. Right? But yet in this present instance, the Jewish Hellenists felt that their widows were being slighted in the, uh, in the daily allotment of food and what have you. So what happens next? So the 12, the 12 go into action. The 12 being the 12 disciples who were, recall, these 12 disciples who had been handpicked right, by our Lord and nurtured by Jesus. For what purpose? In order to launch his church. Right? But then we remember that this 12 had changed since the, 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 the composition of the 12 had changed since the time of the Lord's ascension that we saw in the first chapter of the book of Acts. What was the change? Well, we know obviously that Judas is gone, Judas Iscariot. Right? And then we have Matthias, uh, who was added right, in, in this book of Acts early. Um, he was chosen and he was added by the casting of lots. And yet, we'll hear no more about Matthias after his addition, right? But concerning this 12, right, concerning this 12, we do know that Saul, right, Saul of Tarsus, who would later be the Apostle Paul, we know that Saul of Tarsus, however, will receive his appointment to apostleship by Christ in due time. Later on, Paul, the Apostle, would write in 1 Corinthians 15, he would write, Last of all, as to one abnormally born, the Lord also appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by God's grace, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not ineffective. Well, we may not all be apostles, but I think we can all relate to the glorious statement. For those of us who are in Christ, like Paul said, I am what I am. We are what we are. And that is redeemed believers who will be glorified with the Lord one day. Now, this, this current 12, they had this problem. And, and, and to their credit, they took um, a very serious and pragmatic approach to this problem, this complaint. Yet at the same time, they were able to maintain their own fidelity to their own commission. That commission being the attention and proclamation of God's word, right? And we saw in the text that the proclamation of God's word, the handling of God's word, the study of God's word, it was all cultivated um, in prayer. So we have this uh, joint commission to be men of prayer, people of prayer, and to be proclaimers of God's word. Verse 3 says, Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. Okay, so what we have going on, we have delegation, right? very appropriate, acceptable, and required. Um, and, and these seven men, they were to be chosen by the congregation, not by the apostles. But it was the apostles, however, who produced or conveyed the criteria for these men, right? And that was good reputation, full of the spirit, full of wisdom. 
Take a look at that list one more time. Good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom, right? Nice set of uh, qualities, characteristics. Um, they're very appropriate qualities for those in church leadership. Uh, makes us wonder if we had made the cut, right? We start with good reputation, and I think what we can say about this, for the sake of our Lord, for the sake of Christ, believers ought to take care uh, to keep our reputation unstained, unblemished. And, and that speaks to our character. That speaks to our integrity. That speaks to our faithfulness in Christ. Second quality, full of the Spirit. Well, we've already seen this, this, this disposition, if you will, already in the book of Acts. Uh, this, this notion that one can be full of the Spirit. Well, this is, um, this is a person empowered, controlled, dominated by God's Spirit, uh, as opposed to one who makes provision for the flesh and is governed by it. Right? That's quality number two. And then the third criteria, full of wisdom. Well, it almost goes without saying this would be godly wisdom. Okay? And this would be a, a person who is marked by discernment, right? A discerning person, one who is enlightened by God, and takes the step in life of applying that understanding to the practical matters of this life, full of wisdom. In regards to wisdom, wisdom, excuse me, um, we know that Jesus called the wise person the one who builds his his house, his his life on 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 the rock, and the rock being uh, the obedience to to his sayings to to his precepts, to his instructions. Um, scripture goes on and, and is very dramatic in, in its presentation, contrasting the wise person with the fool. So then in the first century and today, then the church must insist always that our leaders are full of wisdom and not given to folly. Mm -hmm. Verse 5 reads, So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And Philip and gives us the rest of the guys. So these are the seven chosen by the church. And um, let me note that these seven all have Greek names, right? And the Greek names imply that uh, they were all Hellenist, right? And, and that makes it plausible then that the church may have chosen them, these particular seven men, in order to perhaps amend the apparent inequities uh, concerning the Hellenist widows. In verse 6, the text says that they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So this, this practice of laying on of hands, um, what we know from the Bible is um, this practice was symbolic. It was a symbolic practice, and it was in the sense of, of a prayer, right? A prayer that God would supply the necessary gifts that um, that these individuals would need. And this practice also signified uh, affirmation and support and, and identification with someone and that individual's ministry. And even going back to the Old Testament, we see a glimpse of this uh, when we see Moses commissioning Joshua, right? Where through the laying on of hands, some of Moses's authority was conferred on Joshua, right? So apparently what we have in our present text is, is a similar instance with the apostles delegating their authority to the seven that had been selected by the church. And then note that Stephen, this Stephen, he was singled out as a man full of faith and, and the Holy Spirit. And soon we'll see that um, he became somewhat of a magnet to people in need. And at the same time, he became a target of a very um, pronounced opposition. So as our narrative moves forward, notes there on laying on of hands. As our narrative moves forward, um, we see that the preaching of God about God flourished and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly. 
and a large group of priests, right? A large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Now that's remarkable. And uh, this could not have been pleasing to the relig religious establishment. Yet, um, in this case, we see the power of the gospel at work. The power of the gospel that the Apostle Paul would write later about in, in his epistle to the Christians at Rome, consider his words when he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? Why? Because for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, right? So we see this power at work even in these priests who were believing in Christ. So we can say then that even those involved in, in the old covenant, right? Even those involved in the old covenant sacrificial system were beginning to recognize that Jesus, the Messiah, had ushered in the new covenant. And this is also reminis reminiscent of our previous chapter in Acts where Gamaliel raised this notion of fighting against God, right? And um, clearly these priests in our text for today who bowed and confessed Christ, they couldn't resist the revelation of the Messiah and the salvation and the glory that was found in him. And for obvious reasons, the influx of uh, such men were moment, was a momentous occasion in the church's development, these very learned and very influential men. And that brings us to our second passage for today, starting at verse 8. Our text says that Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some from what is called the Freedmen Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, came forward and disputed with Stephen. But they were unable to stand up against the wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Then they persuaded some men to say, We heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, so they came, dragged him off, and took him to the Sanhedrin. They also presented false witnesses who said, This man does not stop speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we heard him say that Jesus, this Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently and saw him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Well, let's look at this text. What we have in this passage, uh, first off, is the first reference in the book of Acts to someone other than the apostles performing wonders and signs. And we see that in Stephen. Uh, Stephen's spiritual gifts and filling by the Holy Spirit are, are on full display here. But, but this was also where persecution of the church in Palestine begins to take root, right? But we'll, we're going to see that in God's sovereignty, that his plans and his purposes are always fulfilled. And, and that never changes. And we could say that never changes from, from everlasting to everlasting. So me personally, throughout this time of global pandemic, I've been drawn to the book of Job because... To me, it seems to underscore just, just how little uh, we know. And um, in that book, Job, verse, I'm sorry, verse 2, chapter 42, says, Job says, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours, Lord, can be thwarted. And the, the prophet Isaiah echoes a similar sentiment in uh, chapter 14, verse 27, of his uh, book, he says, For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Right? So in those two verses, we see that that's the faithfulness of God that is it's yet but one of the, the, the buttresses and sustainers of our hope. And, and we know about this hope because Paul wrote about this hope in the book of Romans. We know this hope will not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's talk about this um, Freedmen's Synagogue. Uh, this Freedmen Synagogue. These freedmen, they were Jews. They were Jews who had once been slaves of Rome, and now they had been set free 
and, and established themselves in Jerusalem. And they were numerous enough to have uh, even a synagogue of their own. So we have Cyrenians, right? you have Cyrenians who came from Cyrene, a city in North Africa. Right? You may recall the, the man Simon, who had been basically forced to carry uh, Jesus' cross, was a native of Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene. And then we have Alexandrians uh, who come from Ale Alexandria, right? another major North African city which was located near the, uh, the mouth of the, the Nile River. Uh, and then we have Cilicia and Asia, which were both uh, Roman provinces in Asia Minor, which many of you know today is uh, modern Turkey. So we look at what was going on, and um, we know that it was quite natural for Stephen, who was a Hellenist himself, uh, would choose to witness to these Jews. Why? Because these were his people. Right. These were his people with a common background in Greek thought and Greek culture. And, um, and these people were a relatively more intellectual, philosophical uh, group of people who took that approach to, to their Jewish religion. And it was their custom to have uh, debates over religious, religious issues. It was what they did. And incidentally, um, you know, there were many synagogues in Jerusalem. We know synagogues were simply places of worship and study that were in all cities during this era where there were enough Jews to maintain one. Now, since Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, his hometown was Tarsus, and that was located in Cilicia, because of that, it's, it's, it's almost certain that uh, a very young Saul of Tarsus, uh, this brilliant uh, student of Gamaliel, was present and, and challenging Stephen in this synagogue. And the outcome may be one explanation for his very evil part in, in the stoning of Stephen that we'll see later. So what we see happening here, Stephen preached, and he preached Jesus as the Messiah. And as a result of doing that, he met opposition. Um, the word in our text that's translated uh, disputing de denotes a, a formal debate. Um, it's a very formal debate, yet... These men, the text tells us, were unable to stand against his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Um, to me, this looks and sounds like Job's discourse with God, back to the book of Job. And we know how that ended. You see, we can conclude from the book of Job that man's limited knowledge and very limited wisdom, they're dwarfed utterly by God's omnipotence, by God's omniscience, and his perfect wisdom. And after Job, uh, we see that after 42 chapters in Job, but after Job had philosophically tussled with the Lord, all Job could say was, surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Therefore, I take back my words and repent in dust, in dust and ashes. The words of Job. Now, unlike Job, however, these men in this synagogue, they just became frustrated. And really, they became desperate. And so, and so as with Jesus, they, they resorted to um, really wicked behavior. And they secretly recruited false witnesses to spread lies about Stephen and I. I emphasize that phrase, false witnesses, because it's likely that when you hear that phrase, false witnesses, that you think of, you know, the Decalogue, the, the Ten Commandments. And, and I, I know that this particular commandment doesn't get a lot of play, but, but it's profoundly evil to bear false witness against your neighbor. And who, but, who better but Israel, these Jews included, should have been compelled to uphold this very important ethical principle. So this charge, this charge against Stephen, what was the charge? It was it was blasphemy, right? And we had an accident to each one of their false witness against your neighbor. Right? Now the charge was blasphemy, and we know that the punishment for blasphemy was stoning to death. Right? In Leviticus, the, the Bible tells us that uh, moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native, 
when he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. So, so people also accuse Jesus of, of threatening the temple. When we really wade into what these accusations were all about, the temple, and I'll cover one more, but, but, but people accuse Jesus of the same thing, of threatening the temple. And, and as a matter of fact, people would later make the same accusations against the Apostle Paul. Right? So it's quite possible that this, this temple charge uh, may have been related to the, to the Christian claim, the legitimate Christian claim, that Jesus' sacrificial death completes and fulfills the temple's sacrificial system and Jesus and his body, the church, represent the new temple of God. All right? So we take a legitimate claim, a legitimate Christian claim, that it, it's true the, that Jesus' sacrificial death, it does complete and fulfill the temple's sacrificial system, and that Jesus and his body, the church, represent the new temple of God. Right? And so this claim... Uh, first about the temple may have stemmed from that very legitimate Christian claim. And then we see one of the other claims that the customs Moses handed down to us that um, Philip was threatening right, those customs that Moses has handed down and, and sought to change them. So what can we say about this accusation? Well, we can say that this accusation may come from the Christian claim that the true and legitimate Christian claim that salvation comes through faith in Christ rather than by the works of the law, right? And we know this to be true. Well, we consider Stephen's proclamation, and what we do know is that Stephen, taking Paul's words again from Roman, we, Romans, we know that he was not ashamed of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this, this Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When Christ himself opened and read scripture in a synagogue, the scripture pointed to him. And it's very likely that Stephen too read from the Old Testament in this synagogue, perhaps maybe even from Isaiah chapter 53. So indulge me for just a moment. Isaiah 53, the Bible says, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. Well, in actuality, the early, the early Christian claim was that the God of the Jews' ancestors was now doing a new thing in fulfillment of the purpose for which he gave the law and the temple in the first place. And finally, our text tells us all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. You can't read that and not recall perhaps Moses' face at Mount Sinai. When Moses received the tablets from the Lord and came down to the people, his face was radiant. And when we think about Stephen's face appearing as an angel, I think we also recall Christ Jesus the Lord himself at the transfiguration. We're told in Luke chapter 9 that in this, in this event, if you will, this transfiguration, 
we see that the Lord's face appeared like a sun. And so here to Stephen, in being accosted by these individuals as he proclaims the, the magnificent, glorious gospel, gospel of Jesus Christ, those who beheld him that day looked upon him and his face appeared as an angel. Well, this is Stephen's story, but Stephen's story is not over. But, but that is our limit for the day. So may God bless you as you continue to study this tremendous 